الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين صدق الله العظيم we were talking about different steps that we have to take in order to control our nafs and to make this nafs used to the ta'ad, the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and control the habits of the nafs that were there in the childhood and they keep on growing as we grow and they keep on getting stronger as the human being gets stronger and subhanallah the process works in such a way that the earlier we take care of these things the easier it is because in the childhood these things are still weak all of our habits, they get more strong, strong and firm in a person and his personality as the person grows up. So if we grow with those habits, they start getting very strong. The earlier we take care of them, the easier it is for the person. This is why those who have been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to have the company of the sulaha in the childhood, at the young age, we see that in a very short time, they have very great achievements. When we study the biographies of the scholars of Islam, those who were blessed with the company of the sulaha in the childhood, their parents may have been the ones that really took care of them properly, teaching them the right Islamic manners and behaviors. When they grow up, it's easy for them to practice the deen of Allah comparing to others. And at the same time, their abilities in doing the good things is much stronger than the ones that may have come later on. Many of these scholars of Islam, when they were asked about how did they achieve some of the things that they had performed in their lives, they normally refer to the situations that really helped them in their childhood. My mother used to do this. My father, he used to wake me up. My uncle used to make me do this. We see a lot of this in the biographies of the scholars of Islam that they realized that it was something that was developed in those hearts and minds since childhood. And of course, since that habit was developed in the childhood, it grew, the good habits grew in the person and they became stronger as the person got stronger. So if the bad ones are going to grow, then they are going to get stronger once the person is strong and in his youth. And if the good ones are developed in the childhood, then they grow and get stronger when the person is strong and he's in his youth. Sometimes, shaitan brings a thought to our mind that I will change once I get older. And this is one of the tricks of shaitan. Of course, no one knows when he or she is going to depart the world and if we will get the chance to change later on or not. Or God forbid, even if the person gets to the age where he was thinking I would change at that age, maybe the Hidayah will not come to him at that age. Got so bad, so far away in his things that now he's too far from the Hidayah. Wallahu alam what happens to the person. But if none of these opt obstacles are there, say there is a guarantee, yes, I will be able to change once I grow up. <coughs> Remember, 
The earlier we do, the better and, the e and easier it is for us. And it will be stronger. And of course, the stronger these good feelings and good behaviors are, the closer the relationship will be to Allah, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't want to just satisfy ourselves by having a kalima and few things with it. We want to have the strongest relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possible. We don't want to stop at any limit. We, want, we would just like to advance with our relationship, with our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, day by day, not day by day. In fact, second by second, these, this relationship, this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to grow and has to get stronger. If anyone would have been satisfied by their relationship, by their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those would have been Anbiya alayhim salatu wassalam, okay, we are prophets. We really don't need to go any further. We are guaranteed the Jannah. Everything is there. But these Anbiya alayhim salatu wassalam. They were never satisfied with it. They always wanted even a stronger relationship than they already had. And day by day, every minute, every second, their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was getting stronger and stronger. This is why the hadith that says Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do istighfar more than 70 times a day. In some of the hadith he says, I do istighfar 100 times a day. In some of the hadith, Sahaba Ridwan Allah alayhi wa tell us that we used to count Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doing istighfar just in one gathering. He would do it more than 100 times. He's sitting with the Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi They are benefiting from the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sitting quietly over there. And he's doing his istighfar. So they used to count how much istighfar is he going to do now. And he, the Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi wa said, just in one gathering he used to do istighfar more than 100 times. What was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doing the istighfar for? Very important question. That if Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam are free from sins, protected against sins, we can say they are immune for, against sins. Then, what was this istighfar for? Hafiz ibn Hajar rahmatullahi alayhi, as he talked about it in detail, he says scholars have one opinion about it. One, uh, one of the opinions of the scholar regarding this is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not doing istighfar for the sins. There were no sins. لِيَغْفِرَ لَكَ اللَّهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِن ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخْرَ there were no sins. The istighfar was as his connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every second was getting stronger and stronger. So every time he looks back, a few minutes ago I was at that position, at that stage, astaghfirullah. He's looking at the high stage status that he's getting every second, and he looks back and he says, astaghfirullah. Was I there? So this was the istighfar for that every second he's getting higher and higher with his position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As far as that position we can never understand because we, our brain, our understanding, our mind doesn't have the ability and capability of getting to that height. That, that ability is not there in our mind. To get to that height to see if there is someone there. Our brain gives up much before that. Just to understand, through an example, as Muhaddisin have explained, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he received the prophethood. Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam squeezed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam three times. As Muhaddisin have explained, in the third time when he squeezed him, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got to the level of Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam in closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After the third time, now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started proceeding with his journey, his tariq ila Allah, his journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After some years, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was taken 
for Isra and Mi'raj. During that journey, Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam accompanied Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to Baytul Maqdis and towards the, to the heavens. And finally, a stage came up there where Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Ya Muhammad, this is, this is it for me. I can't go, I can't proceed any further. Now it's only you, no one besides you, it's only you who can go further from here. And keep, keep on going up. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa then continued his journey. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى He was on a distance of just two bows. Or even closer than that. فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى At that time, Allah told His servant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, things that me and you cannot understand, whatever he told him, مَا أَوْحَى Whatever I told him, I told him whatever I told him. It's not something that can be expressed in words. Can be understood by this, these brains and these minds. So, أَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ He told His servant and he, he revealed to him, what did he reveal to him? Ma awha, whatever he revealed to him. So now we see Jibreel alayhi salatu is stopping at that position and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continuing. That was a physical journey. That was an indication that in the spiritual journey, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has gone much beyond Anbiya the rest of the Malaika and even Jibreel alayhi salatu was now he's at the stage that no other creature can get to that, uh, in, uh, to that closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had. And this was uh, still when he's in Makkah before the hijrah. And he continued with that journey even after that. So of course, now we just through this we can have Little understanding of how close Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam must have been to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But still, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is looking to get closer and closer and go even higher status than what he had. And this is why as he's proceeding further and further with closeness to Allah, there is no end to it. There is no end to that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His attributes they are infinite, there is no end to it. And therefore, closeness to Allah has no end to it. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, minute by minute, second by second, is getting closer and he looks back and says, Astaghfirullah. So we don't want to stop at any stage. When a person gets satisfied and stops at certain stage, that's it. That simply means, now the downfall have started. That is the beginning of the downfall. That okay, I got what I wanted. Now my iman is perfect. My iman is complete. My amal are perfect. I don't need to get any better. My my relationship with Allah is strong enough. That's it. I don't need any more. That's it. That's the downfall of the person. And in fact, if this type of thought would come into the mind, that's, that's enough for me. I really don't need any more. It may be the person falls from the same height that he was up. He, if he got to some height, he may be falling in the same speed as any object would fall from a height down to the ground. This person would come right down to the ground. So we don't want to stop at any stage. We want to continue with this journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for this journey to continue, our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day by day has to get stronger. This connection has to establish. Each time we feel that we have weakened the connection, we have the connection is getting loose through our sins, through our deeds, then we have to come back and reconnect our souls. And connect it with the strong robes now. With a stronger than what we had before because we know the one that was before broke very easily. 
as the scholars have said, that a person who has the true fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that fear is enough to drive away thousand sins a day. If thousand sins will come to him, and a feeling rises up in his mind, that I want to do this, I want to commit this sin. This fear of Allah will drive all of those sins away. And a person who does not have that fear of Allah, the connection is very loose. Then one sin is enough to drive that fear away. Just one sin will drive that fear of Allah away from this person. All what he thought, oh, I'm really afraid of Allah, I have the taqwa of Allah, I'm God-fearing, I'm a true believer, this is how much I recite, this is how much I pray, this is how much I do. All of that, just one sin will take all of that away, will wash it away. So there may be a lot of a'mal, but the connection was not there. Because of not having the connection, one sin will just drive everything away. Now the person will look at him, so, oh, I thought I had a lot of taqwa. I thought I did this amal and those amal and I did so much. Here, one woman was able to take all of my iman and went away. That's it. A woman came, in five minutes, she took the whole taqwa and all of that, and in five minutes everything is gone. I just came out of Atikaf after a whole month. Fasting, avoiding sin, everything. Walked out of the door. She took everything away. The next day is the day of Eid. And we know what happens on the day of Eid. Relatives or non-relatives, everyone shaking hands with every person, men, women, mixing and all the haram. What happened to all of those ibadahs of the Ramadan? The person had just come out of so much ibadah. <laughs> How come it was washed away so fast? Now we may think, what happened to that? I just did so much ibadah. And now the person himself may not even think about it. But if a person is looking at him, this is the person who was doing so much salah, so much azkar, so much tilawa, so much of ibadah. Look at him what he's doing on the day of Eid. What happened? He did not establish that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See the beautiful lesson that these scholars have left for us, that if that connection is established, the real true fear of Allah is there, this fear of Allah will drive thousands sins away. And if the true fear is not there, the connection is not there, then one sin will drive all of this taqwa and all of this fear away. That connection is very important. Without it, there is always, the iman is always in danger. It could go, it could go any minute, any minute it, the person will, will lose it. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he warned against the jal, he said people will be losing their iman in no time. They talk to him, he took the iman of the person away. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised us in the hadith, that if you see the jal, if you happen to see the jal, don't even think of going and arguing with him. Don't even try to go and argue with him. Because even if you go and argue with him, you, he may take your iman away. You may lose your iman by talking to him. Iman so weak. One of the Sahaba, one Allah after hearing the hadith regarding the jal, He started saying, Ya Rasulullah, I'm really afraid of the jal. Sahabi, he's afraid of the jal. Why is he afraid of the jal? He explains, he says, I heard, I heard in the hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that the fitna of the jal, the main fitna of the jal will be uh, through mal, through the wealth. And he says, when I look at my position, my situation, my situation is such some time when I'm hungry and my wife is preparing some bread. 
It's difficult for me to do two rak'ah salah while I'm smelling the bread. I feel like breaking my salah for that bread. For a piece of bread. I feel like breaking my salah. Imagine if the jar will show me treasures, what will happen to me? True. If we look at our situations, with these type of things, how they drive us away, Minor things, small things that really drive us away. Someone said one word. The person sacrificed two sunnahs. Just because that person said one word that he didn't like him. For minor things, we are giving up things away. We have given up so much fara'id, so many sunnah, and so much of deen. Not for any reason, it's only because minor things. Someone didn't want us to do it. I didn't feel like doing it. I had a better offer somewhere else. When Hayya al Salah is being called, Hayya al Falah is being called, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Come to the Salah, come to the success. But I think that I can get it somewhere else. That's the only reason a person will go somewhere else. While he knows that this is where I'm being invited for Salah and for Falah. So this is the fitna. And the only people that will be saved from the fitna, those whose connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. Who have established that strong connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, even with all the a'mal that we perform, we have to make sure these a'mal get into the heart. And these a'mal are for the sake of Allah. And they are connecting us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If these a'mal are just to earn some reward, okay? If I do this, then I will get 100 rewards. Another amal, I will get 70,000 rewards. And third amal, I will get 1 million rewards. So now I came out of the masjid with 2 million rewards altogether. Now I can do whatever I want. Simply means through the amal, the person did not get no connection. The connection has to be there. So for us, we need to establish this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullah. O you who have iman. Allah is calling me and you. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. O you who have this iman. Ittaqullah. Have the taqwa of Allah. How? Wabtagu ilayhi al-wasila. Keep on making your way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wabtagu ilayhi al-wasila. Ibtigha means find. Keep on finding the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't stop. Don't be satisfied by few things that you do. Keep on finding your way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me see how I can do something where today I can get the real pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here I see someone that was in need of something. I helped the person, alhamdulillah. Today I feel that I found an opportunity. Let me grab it. In between my work, I had the time, I had five minutes. I thought this is an opportunity. Find your way to Allah. Let me quickly do two rak'ah salah nafil. I never get the opportunity. Today I got five minutes break in between. Quick now, do two rak'ah salah. Keep on finding your way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to establish our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this connection, once it is established with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there is nothing in the world that can break that connection. Nothing in this world can break that connection. The connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the strongest connection that is available for human beings in this world. People may see that my phone works through the satellite, it never stops. Whatever connection we can establish in this world, there is no connection stronger than our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once it is established. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith, لا يزال عبدي يتق... uh, This is hadith of Qudusi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يزال عبدي يتقرب إلي بالنوافل حتى أحبه. My servant keeps on getting closer to me through the nawafil until I love him. 
Subhanallah, once a person would hear this word, that Allah says, Be, each time you do some nafil, I love you. And you keep on doing it and doing it until I really love you. Who wouldn't want to do this? But the fact remains that we have heard this hadith before, and this may be 101 times that we heard it now. We heard it 100 times before. But when we start looking at ourselves, it may be that yes, for today we will add some more nawafil. But generally, we look at our lives, it's not there. After hearing it so much time, and knowing the importance of it, and having the value of it, still we don't see it there. What is the reason? What is the reason for it? This learning the reason is very important and this is the most important thing that we really need to learn. I will inshallah talk about this reason later. Let me quickly summarize what we have talked about up to now so that we can start working on our souls and learn how to work on it, on our nafs. We talked about establishing a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for establishing a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to stop this nafs from getting in between. If the nafs gets in between, then it will always stop us from connecting ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It disturbs that connection. And if a person goes after the nafs, does not control his nafs, does not learn how to control his nafs, then of course, the, the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not there at all. The full relationship is only with the nafs and the person is trying to satisfy his desires and himself. Some of the scholars of Islam, they even define, you know, every person has his own level of working on his nafs. They even have even defined how to see if we really are not doing any work for our nafs. For those who are working for deen. A person who's working for deen, he's a teacher, he's teaching Quran. Throughout the day he teaches Quran. Throughout the day he's teaching hadith. All he's doing is teaching people the deen of Allah. He's imam, he's leading salah and teaching people. <coughs> a person who's doing the work of deen. How can he see if he's really doing the work of deen? Or we can say, no, it's granted. If a person is imam, then he's established with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his connection is established. If he's teaching Quran, then his connection is established. He's teaching hadith and fiqh, then his connection is established. No, this is not true. This is not true. At every level, the person has to look at, his, uh, at himself, and we have to see if our relationship is there or not. And there are obstacles according to the field that we are in. So the scholars have defined this one thing. They gave us one clue of how to see if really we are doing the work for ourselves or for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when I'm doing this work and someone else comes, someone else comes and he reminds me of something more important that needs to be done this time. Would I be willing to do that work? Or I will say no. I don't want to do nothing else. This is the only thing I would do. If I find myself doing only this, this simply means it's not for the sake of Allah, it's only because of my habit. I think that this is what I want to do. I have chosen some habit for myself. One of the scholars, and this is from the time of Tabah Tabi'in, he says, when I heard this, Imagine, this is how old this example is and this lesson is from Tabah Tabi'in. He says, when I heard this, I judged myself and I found really that I had to work on myself in certain avenues that I never thought about. And he says, I go for Hajj every year. The scholar says, I go for Hajj every year. And I try to do the whole Hajj walking on my feet, I never get on any ride. I don't ride a horse or a camel, nothing. I just walk throughout the Hajj. And I used to consider this as my, one of my greatest deeds. I go for Hajj every year and I walk. Since one day, 
I was home and I'm, I was tired, I was laying down and my mother called me and she said, son, get me a glass of water. And I really felt very difficult to get up and I wished I could have said no to her. Then I said, no, no, it's my mother. If I won't do it, who's going to do it? So I got up. But when that feeling came to me, I realized all of that walking during Hajj, if it was for Allah, then why getting up and walking for my mother, working for a few steps for my mother is difficult for me. Whereas walking in Hajj is only nafil and walking for my, for my mother is fard. He said, I realized that I just got used to that ibadah, that habit. And this is why when the other ibadah came that was more important than this one, I wanted to ignore it. If I had a choice, I would have ignored it. And I felt difficulty doing it. But when I go there, I don't feel no difficulty. I feel great doing it. These are minor things. Mawlana Shaykh Ali Tanwi Rahmatullahi has given another beautiful example. You see, the person walks in a room and an older person walks into the room with him. There is only one seat available. This person sits down and he says to the other person, you sit up. And he gives the, that seat for the other person and he sits on the ground. And then he feels, look, Alhamdulillah, this is good, you know, this is humbleness. That I sat down and I gave him the place to sit up. He says, this is where shaitan came into this person and he's making him feel that this is humbleness and that's the, that is the, uh, the, the arrogance. That is the real arrogance where he feels that by sitting on the ground, I'm really being humble. Otherwise, I deserve to sit up. This is what it means. That I'm being humble by sitting on the ground simply means I deserve to sit up, but I'm really humble, so I will sit down. These are the avenues that shaitan comes to us through them. How to treat this? Treatment is easy. Looking at these avenues looks like it's so difficult. How am I going to find all of these? Yuridullah wa yikhafif ankum. Again, Allah wants to make it easy for us. The solution is easy. And the solution is something that always was practiced in the ummah. And they always achieved what they wanted. When they used the solution, they really got what they wanted. But before getting to the solution, let us go back. And that is establishing the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's important and as mu'min, as believers, we all can understand the importance of it. We all want to establish that relationship. In order to establish the relationship, we have to control our nafs. We have to control our desires. We have to stop our nafs from getting in between. And this nafs, not necessarily, it will come up with sins. There are behaviors that we have from the childhood. They grow and they keep on growing. And as they grow, they prevent us from establishing our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to work on this. Successful, surely, qadr, surely successful will be only those who would purify their nafs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising us. And after taking oath of 11 things, وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ زَاتَلَاهَا He's telling us, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Successful will be only those who would purify them, their nafs. Otherwise, you won't be successful. Do we need anything more to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That He says, I swear, I swear, I swear. I tell you by everything, I swear by this, by this. What is it? Successful will be only those who would purify the nafs. Otherwise, a person would come thinking that he brought a lot, but there is nothing. Because when the nafs is not pure and clean, this dirt cannot enter the Jannah. Jannah is not the place of dirt. Dirt is not a lot. You have to walk through a door that has skinners. That will skin any dirt that the person has on him. Any dirt into the heart. Any dirt in these amal, it will be rejected. You have to go back. Jannah is not the place for dirt. Dirt is not acceptable over there. A person goes with dirt, will be rejected for sure. 
with traveling I have really learned that there are metal detectors. And if you walk through the gate and there is a metal detector, there is any metal, it will beep. Once it beeps, then you have to go through all the, through the search and uh, uh, all the other things that now they will have to be uh, to, to make you go through it. So what we do is make sure there is nothing that has metal in it before we walk through the gate. So we won't have to suffer and go through all of that. It will take only five minutes to go through the other procedure, but still we don't want to go through that. Imagine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, dirt detectors, najasa detectors, najasa in the heart, in the amal, dirt into the heart, those dots of the sins into the heart. All of these effects of the nafs and the shayateen into the heart, no, is not acceptable. Shaitan will not be able to say, I didn't go, but I sent my effect through that person. No. If the effect is there, go where the shaitan is until you get cleaned. The person has to be clean before it gets in. There is no way that dirt can get in there. So, when the snuffs comes in between, then there is always dirt. Then this dunya is there. That prevents us from establishing that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, in order to establish the connection, our nafs has to be clean and pure. We have to control our nafs. And for controlling the nafs, we talked about struggling, mujahada. This will give us the power to control our nafs through the mujahada. And we talked about it. With the mujahada, we said we have to do muraqabat al nafs, which means watching our nafs. And with watching the nafs, we see that the nafs today we did this, this, this. I said this and that. I heard this and that. I ate this and that. Then muhasabat al nafs, judging ourselves. Why did I do this today? What was the reason for me to say this? Muhasabah. After the muhasaba, now still we find that we are having a good control. But still those things are coming to us. There is always attack. And we start getting bothered by these attacks. And the person is continuously being bothered by these attacks and is still not able to do what he's supposed to do. Now he's controlling this. But continuously he's holding to the rope. No, I'm not letting you, I'm not letting you. For how long is he going to be just holding and fighting over here? He has to stop that war that is going between him and his nafs so that he's free to do the amal and establish the connection on the other hand. How to do this? Insha'Allah, we will talk about this in our next session. How to establish that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to have full control over the nafs where then insha'Allah these attacks, we will, will know as soon as an attack is there, we will know that it's going to be attacked. And we know how to protect ourselves from all of these different attacks of the shaitan and different tricks, the small tricks that we talked about, how we control, how we prevent ourselves from being affected by these different tricks of shaitan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us and give us clean and pure nafs and give us tawfiq to have his, this relationship established with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'il al-muslimin wa al-muslimat wa akhru da'wana alhamdulillah.